Hey, security researcher here once again. Thanks for checking out this video. Today I'm joined by another co-author of the internationally best-selling cybersecurity book, Hashtag Hack 2. Autographed copies available on my Patreon if you go here. Robert Cost is an attorney who's been working on the leading edge of technology since pretty much before the internet was launched publicly. We're talking the mid-80s. This interview is really interesting if you're a business owner, if you're concerned about security breaches, cybersecurity risk, uh, if you're just a consumer who has privacy concerns. We cover a lot of ground in this interview, and I think it's important uh, for you to cut some time out to at least take a listen. Now, I've asked Robert, this is a gift to you guys, I've asked Robert to come back and answer your questions, and he agreed to do it. So here's how we're going to work this. Put your questions in the comments section below. And as we have time, we'll go through them, uh, and I will make one promise to you guys. I will absolutely ask the top voted question, as long as it's relevant, um, and we'll see about all the rest of them. I don't know. I, I can't, you know, he's an attorney. I can't twist his arm. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Robert Cost. Let's get everybody uh, up to speed on who you are. Um, your background, some of the highlights of your life and your career, and then, and then we'll kind of bridge back into what we were talking about. Uh, let, let me see if I can race through who I am real quickly. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm an old guy with uh, a long history in uh, technology, having started some technology companies uh, way back at the beginning. Really, I, I worked for the U.S. Congress in a, in a branch called the Office of Technology Assessment, which did technology policy work and, and uh, recommendations and findings to the Congress so that they could uh, intelligently uh, uh, legislate concerning technology issues all the way from what I worked on, which is primarily copyright uh, and intellectual property issues, to privacy issues, which I also worked on, to uh, genetic engineering, to nuclear power, to uh, strategic defense, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but Congress, in their wisdom, didn't want any advice when it came to technology policy. And so the, the agency was killed some years ago. But I had already left by then, started a job with uh, a company called Prodigy, which was at the time owned by IBM, Sears, and CBS. Um, and this was 10 years prior to the, the web, really, uh, blossoming back in the mid-'80s. And uh, I worked there for almost 10 years as a corporate counsel. I, I, I'm a lawyer, I'll admit that. Uh, and while there, I it was really fun and interesting job at the time because I was doing contracts for an online service which no one had ever heard of before. And so I wrote most many of the early banking contracts, the early grocery shopping contracts, um, so on and so forth. Uh, and I did a patent there that ultimately... Um, uh, yielded three and a half billion dollars to IBM when they took back the the assets of Prodigy after Prodigy's dissolution, um, and that that was because that patent was a so so called pioneer patent at the time, and it read on things like Java and the way Java works by distributing work down to the PC to be done there. I did that for a long time. Jumped out uh, some years later and joined their advanced technology group. Uh, and we built an online service for businesses. It was a B2B service rather than the consumer service that Prodigy had put together. And it was the first service uh, to run on Microsoft Windows, uh, including uh, you know uh, AOL and CompuServe. Uh, we beat them to the punch and integrated some local applications with what would today be called a cloud service uh, in Prodigy. But then... Um, that pro that program was shut down when IBM laid off 100,000 people and when Prodigy had to take its lumps. I left Prodigy, started a company in the 90s that would today be called a digital agency. And so we were in New York City doing websites and back-end integrations for American Express and IBM and uh, Martha Stewart and Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines and UPS and so on and so forth. And that became a big company on the NASDAQ for a while. And uh, and then for a few years, uh, in the wake as well of 9-11, uh, 
uh, things were quiet. And I, I went back into technology and started up another company. We built an online travel app that integrated directly with Microsoft and Google Calendar so that, so that travel booking became a matter of calendar management um, as much as anything else. And that same service connected directly to the back ends of, uh, of the suppliers of airlines and hoteliers and so on and so forth, saving them, you know, between, between 10 and $20 of booking, which was the essence of our business case. That one blew up in 2008 when the economy crashed again. And I, I went back in and started another company called, uh, uh, thematics, which still exists today, which is involved in semantic technology, um, and, a, a sort of allied branch called business architecture. Um, so that's still going on, but I've, in the meantime, created my own, uh, virtual law firm. It, it's entirely virtual. I'm a Pennsylvania lawyer. And so I'm limited to serving Pennsylvania clients and Pennsylvania matters, but nevertheless, uh, I'm able to successfully, uh, serve my clients and even get new clients all the way from Sarasota, Florida, where I've been hanging out, um, for a long time now. So I kind of come to this and, and Albert Whale had asked me, he and I were talking, were collaborating, um, uh, because what I wanted to provide as part of my services here, um, was, uh, a legal cybersecurity assessment and Albert, uh, had a little magic box that watched the traffic going in and out of the network and could tell that, you know, the Chinese or the Koreans or the, what, what have you were actually in your network. And on the basis of that, I was able to provide the client with an assessment of the legal risks that they, they face. Um, and it was uh, sort of on the basis of that collaboration that Albert invited me to join hashtag, um, Act two, and uh, I wrote a chapter there, uh, really on um, um, what happens when you're breached, when you find out you're breached. What are the legal requirements? And it's it's funny um, what what the IT security issues have done to companies is essentially put the onus on them um, as a victim of an attack. Uh, they have all of the legal obligations, and there are many. You know, uh, once you've been attacked, there are issues related to, for example, negligence. And the question there is, gosh, how much of what we do can we keep, uh, you know, behind the kimono here? How much of what we do by way of uh, ameliorating or mitigating our security holes are we going to expose in a subsequent negligence lawsuit? Was, does attorney-client privilege um, act here? But beyond that, there are all kinds of statutory and regulatory obligations that you have incurred as a victim uh, that you have to comply with, and your failure to comply can result in big fines. Um, and there are no criminal penalties so far for companies who are, who are victims. But um, I was really surprised as I read your chapter of the book I've got some notes that uh, I had mentioned right before we jumped on here, and I'm going to note that says, so if you pay the ransom, you could be penalized. It's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, isn't it? And it is. I Throughout the entire chapter, there's gotchas for the victim over and over and over again. Yeah. And it's it's mind-blowing. And yet it's surprising that you don't hear more about it. Um, I think it's because it's probably deemed a boring topic because I see on some of the feeds that I have a lot of the security breaches that are happening and they're big, they're massive. They impact huge swaths of populations. Yeah. And you almost don't hear anything about it in any sort of significant outlet. I find that yeah. odd. I'm sorry, but go ahead. No, I was really, I was, like I said, I was really surprised by the damned if you do, damned if you don't aspect of it. Well, that's, that's right. I mean, that, that particular, um, law, uh, that you're referring to, um, really has to do with, uh, counterterrorism and, and the effort on the part of the United States government to make sure that we're not funding, uh, terrorist organizations, either intentionally or ac accidentally. And there's a list of of uh, 
of bad actors maintained on a government website, which uh, uh, any company um, has to ensure that it's it's not somehow doing business with them and paying a uh, a, a ransomware ransom uh, is a way of paying terrorists. And so you're kind of caught in this bind. It's not as draconian as it sounds because you would what you would do is it's the Department of the Treasury that actually enforces this rule. Uh, what you would do is put yourself in treasure in contact with Treasury officials and work through it with them. Um, you know you're 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 not penalized for uh, trying to save your business, um, but it's it's where you uh, cooperate with bad actors uh, without bringing the government in somehow. Um, right. To help inform your decision making here, where you where you really get into trouble. So let's let's actually go back to the uh, the story that this comes out of. Uh, it was a ransomware attack. Um, uh, ironically, not on any uh, of Colonial's, uh, so to speak, uh, sort of mission critical or operating um, uh, su- systems or subsystems. In other words, it was not. A computer, for example, in charge of uh, controlling uh, valves or shunting uh, oil off in one pipeline or another, it was their billing system that was attacked. And um, here the, the the issue became, you know, do we pay the ransomware? And they brought the, the police and the government in more or less directly after this happened and decided to go ahead and pay it off because this was in addition to affecting national... Um, Colonial Pipeline's uh, uh, profitability here. It was a it was a, a national security issue because essentially gasoline or oil transport for the whole East Coast had been knocked out, um, and there were shortages up and down the you know the um, from Boston down to Washington D.C. Uh, because that was a, sort of the terminus. I think it was in New Jersey. This pipeline terminated from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so that was brought down for a while until they paid the ransom, and sure enough, the ransom yielded some uh, encryption keys that allowed them to, you know, uh, get their their systems back online again. But um, yeah, uh, that's crazy. Did anybody ever get caught for that? No, no, not to my knowledge. Um, and I, you know, I think it was uh, established that these were Russian actors. Um, interesting. Somehow involved here, but no, no one was ever caught. You know, one of the things uh, I was out in D.C. for uh, the last three months of 2018, and uh, one of the things that was brought up uh, was the impact that breaches have not just on the data, the people that are victims of it ultimately, because of that data, if it's personal data of like clients identifiable information, your social security numbers, credit cards, blah, 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 blah. Um, the impact that that has on, on the end user, so to speak, is bad. But when you look at the impact on the company, the damage to the reputation, uh, I mean, it's, it's far bigger than just legal fees and compensation. I mean, it, it really can damage uh, an organization. I think about the target breach and what that basically did to target. That was billions of dollars in damage beyond, you know, improvements that they had to do on security, but it's really significant. I, I, I'm shocked that we're so loose with some of the stuff that we're loose with when it comes to cybersecurity. There's legal risk, but the, the principal concern for, and rationally so, the principal concern for most companies is really the business risk and the reputational risk here. Because it goes to the heart of questions about the competence of this company, uh, my willingness to share my credit card data with you, um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is where you know, and this this is where there's a a good relationship between, say, the the uh, the company and its customer. They don't want to lose their customers. It, it gets even worse where I'm not really the customer. I'm I'm part of the product here. For example, in the Equifax breach of a few years ago, um, it was established among 
uh, what 175 million other people's information that my information was taken too. And what I get for that is uh, not any kind of reparations or not a, any kind of proactive efforts to track down, you know, where my where my sensitive information might have migrated. Instead, I get a credit monitoring service free for a year. Now, there are exposures here as well. Uh, you know, class action lawsuits, uh, having even a, a, a large uh, sample of 175 million people suing you as a class is a real issue for these companies. And it can, it can really seriously hurt their bottom line. But in a class action lawsuit, it's not, it's almost never really the end user customer um, individual who's compensated here. The people who are compensated are by and large, the attorneys bringing the class action lawsuit. You know, you may be eligible for $25 in credit. You may be eligible for $50 in credit, uh, you know, multiplied times hundreds of millions of people that that's significant. But it's, it's like I say, it's really the lawyers who are, uh, getting satisfaction from a class action lawsuit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, so let me ask you something. When, when you started out with this work, what is it that intrigued you by it? What is it that drives you? What's the curiosity at the core of who you are that, that keeps you tied to this stuff? Cause there's obviously some sort of fire that you have specifically for technology. My background my educational background is a weird one. I have an undergraduate and a graduate degree in philosophy, of all things. And philosophically, I think that uh, we're in an interesting turning point in history where technology, broadly speaking, uh, information technology, but uh, as well, you know, um, biotechnology and other technologies, nanotechnology, they are they are affecting sort of the, the fundamental assumptions that we proceed on in our day-to-day -day lives. They're changing who we are. Uh, and so it's technology, I think, that's driving history today. And I wanted to just be part of that er from early on. And I, uh, as I was going to law school, um, to get involved in uh, things related, in, and again, this was in the 80s, things related to uh, computer technology. And I was just taken bitten by that and that's um it was an incredible time the birth of the internet was life-changing for everybody oh for, yeah. for everybody and and people that are alive today that don't know the world without it don't get it i wasn't prepared to translate that as i was doing that little tease oh, that little mark with the a and then the ring around it at see that's what i said mm -hmm. um case that she thought it was about yeah. Oh. But I've never heard or it. I've never heard it about said. About I'd always say the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, well, I heard it around or about in the lunchroom. Yeah. See, <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE, com. I mean. Well, well Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet that anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network. The one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one, what do you write to it? Like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in 10 seconds or less. Uh, oh, oh. Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a giant computer network made up, made up of, uh, started from... Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a computer at the dictionary. billboard. It's, it's not a, it's, 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 it's a computer billboard, but it's made right. wide. Several uh, universities and everything all joined together. Right. And others can access it. Right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. It came just right. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie, you know, but you don't, need, you don't need that. You don't need a phone line to operate it out. No, no, apparently not. You know, there's always been this debate whether, and, and people seem to, to satisfy themselves that, no, you know what, technology is a neutral thing. And it can be used for good or it can be used for ill, and it's up to us. That's a very common sort of point of view. I don't share that point of view. I think technology carries with it its own sorts of imperatives, uh, its own sorts of uh, deterministic um, um, 
uh, momentum, if you will. And it's and just by virtue of the way it structures our lives, it carries us along um, in a certain direction. There are implicit values already the moment the technology has been built and offered. Um, implicit values concerning privacy or, or no privacy. Uh, implicit values concerning how we treat people, masses of people. I think that technology um, is to some degree independent of our own you know, human decision-making. Um, well, decisions are being made at some level. It's just not... It's it's the lines becoming blurred is what's happening, and and we're not. Are we along for the ride, or are we driving this thing? I think a lot of people think we're driving this thing when we're really along for the ride. I think that's right. Yeah. And combine that with the logic of of sort of uh, mature capitalism and what's important to the shareholders, and there are some, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the average person's done at that point. Right. Yeah. I, I, so, um, I, I, you know, we can, we can do what we will. We're already talking about the, you know, who was it? Uh, Steven's book, the snow crash. Uh, we're already talking about the metaverse. That's the, the latest, the latest buzzword, um, um, in, in conversations here. But I mean, my observation is as, as we watch the internet happen and it, it all happened faster than I would have believed. Um, it was kind of like an onslaught uh, into the culture at large, uh, which we weren't ready for. We're still not ready for. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't know how to think of it at all before we had already adopted it as part of day-to-day -day life. And, and here it is, as you point out, you know, in our back pocket, um, following us along. Uh, and now we're ready to jump into the metaverse. And now, you know, the Internet of Things is coming. They don't really talk about that a whole lot yet. Um, mm -hmm. But that's that's a looming issue. There's a lot of privacy concerns with that. Um, you know, but a generation from now, privacy is not going to mean anything to anybody. Yeah. And it, I mean, it, the very meaning of privacy is kind of been changing um, because prior to all of this technology, as you and I were growing up, is it? Um, out in public, um, there, there was never any concern that our so-called public behavior was ever being recorded or, or tracked. Um, right. I, t I mentioned the fact that there was a time when security cameras had to point in towards private property. They could not point out into public spaces. Mm -hmm. And it was because you had an expectation of privacy. Mm-hmm. And that's not that long ago. And then 9-11 happened and they just ran around saying, nobody has any expectation of privacy in the public. It's the public square. You paid for it with your tax dollars. That's right. It's one of those places, things, and effects that's listed in the Fourth Amendment. But people don't, I don't know if it's the people's understanding of privacy has changed or if people's understanding of. The legal protections here, especially the Fourth Amendment protections, are kind of circular because the question is, does this person have a reasonable expectation, you know, concerning sunbathing nude in their backyard? Well, um, gee, uh, what's a reasonable expectation today and what's a reasonable expectation 30 years ago are two different things. Oh, you'd have to have a canopy over your backyard. Right. And then you're not going to be sunbathing. But 30 years ago, you didn't have to worry about that. That's right. It's, it's crazy. It's, it's hence was enough. So the norms are shifting. Um, and, and there again, they're being carried along by the technology. Uh, so what's a reasonable expectation? It's not reasonable for you to expect to be not photographed in New York City. Um, if you turn, turn a block, <laughs> there, there are a dozen more cameras on that block. Oh, yeah. So it's, it's like that everywhere. You know, it's not reasonable for you to expect uh, yeah. the, any kind of what n control over your and now she's think about this you see that now think about this let's I, what if we wanted street view live real time in every neighborhood of the country how would we get there oh i got it let's sell doorbells that have cameras on them so now you have no reasonable expectation of privacy even outside your house 
even with your blinds open. Right. Because there's now cameras everywhere. So why would you think that you have any sort of pride? That's insane. That's crazy. Yep. Yep. This is, this is, that's crazy. That one burns. I got to let that sink in. Yeah. <laughs> that's That's right. You know, the Europeans and then followed by California have attempted, I suppose, to do something about it uh, and given people, individuals, rights. Um, these these statutes are uh, typically when there's a uh, some sort of government statute regulating some kind of activity, typically it's uh, enforced by the attorney general or enforced by, you know, the uh, Department of Justice or, or whatever the government entity is in uh, in charge um and they're the ones that have the right to bring the lawsuit under this but what's unique about gdpr is it's both government agencies but as well individuals who have uh legal rights under that um and it, oh, are we going here are we going here can we go going again? oh i want to go here so robert and i had a conversation uh the other day um i believe in the experiment that is the United States. I think that this is freedom's last stand. And if we lose here, it's over. When the word, the, the word privacy came up or the concept of privacy came up was the fourth amendment of the U S constitution. Mm -hmm. And it's the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and persons or things to be seized. When this is discussed, this is discussed in terms of citizens and government and that government doesn't have the right to unless they do the following. But my argument is that it says in the very first sentence, the right of the people to be secure in their person's houses, papers, and effects. Mm -hmm. That means you have that right, period. Now, government is there to both respect and protect your rights. Then right. why are they not intervening in the constant and persistent violations of our privacy? Oh, that's right, because everybody's agreeing to terms of service they're not reading. And they don't understand what they're agreeing to. And they're giving access to the microphone, the camera, processor time, file storage, to applications from TikTok to a flashlight. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand how they're being surveilled and why advertisements are popping up everywhere. And how do they know what they know? You're giving them permission, guys. You're not thinking, you're just acting. You just want the dopamine hit that you get for getting what you want. And it, we got to stop this. We have, or it's over again. Uh, you know, we're just the United States of technology at this point, And we're just going to throw everything else away. Uh, I, it's just, there's a lot of societal discussions that have to have happen. Um, again, do the drawbacks outweigh the benefits of the internet? I don't know. The further we get into this conversation, the less I'm feeling it. <laughs> Yeah, we don't have any choice here. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, the Fourth Amendment, like every other part of the Constitution, binds only the United States and state governments uh, and requires state action, um, uh, which can sometimes bring in private concerns if the government somehow favors or enables private firms to do things, uh, you know, you know, positively enables them somehow by providing money, by providing resource, by, you know, um, uh, explicitly giving them permissions to do certain things, you can make a case for state action. Uh, but otherwise, as concerns Facebook, as concerns Google and all of the rest, um, the Constitution in no way binds them to anything, even though the right, the right of privacy is explicitly recognized there, it, it it affects only our relationship with the government. And, you know, what we need is a Congress that is working on behalf of the people of the United States and not on behalf of the donors uh, of the United States uh, so that we can, you know, at least make laws that somehow constrain these companies. And, you know, uh, California is out there. Virginia is now out uh, within the last month or so with their own versions of the GDPR 
um, you know, which give individuals rights over their personal data. And these rights are enforceable and they, they can bring lawsuits for money damages and those lawsuits can actually sting. So it's possible, it's possible for us to recapture this. Um, it's possible for us to, you know, push back the high tide here. Um, and I, I wonder if enough people care is really, I think the thing that troubles me the most is I, I recognize and you do too, that we can do something to put up seawalls for lack of a better way to put it. We can be the Dutch. Um, and if that's our defense, then we've got to do it. I, I mean, we're the negative impacts. I, I'll just be honest. No, the negative impacts way outweigh any benefits that we're getting from the internet at this point. Our kids are screwed up. Our country's screwed up. We got rid of civics in most schools. And now all anybody knows is TikTok videos. And I, it's just, it's madness. We're losing this place and it's really damaging. This well, country. <laughs> we're going to go there. But um, I, I, I think that um, there's a breakdown in consciousness in the United States. I think that the rot begins at the bottom of the pyramid here. And our politicians are only taking advantage of that fact, but we're oh, absolutely. we're poorly educated, we're overweight, we're uh, n not healthy, we're not uh, particularly we we think we're moral, but that's that's all chest beating, mm -hmm. Bible thumping. Um, uh, so I, I I think that there is that the, uh, that there there are fundamental issues with the state of consciousness in the United States. I agree. And, and maybe it elsewhere in the world, but I don't see any fix for that. It's difficult because before you get some kind of law on the books concerning, say, worker safety, you, you have to have people trapped in a burning building, you know, uh, working in a textile mill or what have you, and everybody dies. And it's recognized as a tragedy. And, you know, the, the legislature responds now with some kind of positive thing. But we've seen this time and time again, especially with respect to cybersecurity here, the Colonial Pipeline was one of them. Are we waiting for someone to take over nuclear pop, nuclear reactors? Uh, are we waiting, what crisis are we waiting for that will precipitate some kind of response? Whose brilliant idea was it to expose any of this stuff to the internet? That's the thing that blows my mind about some of this stuff is as I've gone through my exploration of cybersecurity from a federal, state, and local level, the things that I've learned blow my mind. It's mm. like, whoever thought that was a good idea? And, and I think back, I, my dad and I had a conversation uh, about the time of Fukushima. And at one time, he worked for Stone and Webster and helped build a couple of nuclear power plants. Um, and he said they didn't know plate tectonics during his lifetime. It, well, well, they did. They discovered it during his lifetime. He's like, we had no idea. None of that stuff was, he's like, you know, and I had asked him, I was like, what about like dumping chemicals in the ground? What brilliant idea was that? He's like, we didn't know. He's like, we didn't know about water tables. He's like, we didn't know about any of this stuff. He's like, we've only discovered this stuff within my lifetime. Yeah. He's like, so, you know, you have to kind of take pause and realize that we were really ignorant to a lot of stuff. And the same kind of holds true when something as momentous as the internet comes along. Mm -hmm. But when you start to think about some of the stuff that's exposed, mm -hmm. it's like, who the hell ever thought that hooking up any of this stuff to the internet was a good idea? <laughs> and, and at this point, really, truly, I, I guess it's a statement that I've been making in some of the presentations that I've been giving is that the threat matrix has shifted the entire field is now completely different than it was before there used to be security through obscurity there used to be this barrier to entry to get to any of this stuff but that barrier in a lot of ways for a lot of people that any, take any time to do it is falling away and it's becoming easier and easier and more and more exposure creates more and more risk you know, it's thank God they never hooked up the ICBMs to it. I'm sure there was somebody in government that was like, hey, why don't we take and hook the ballistic missiles? <laughs> hey, <laughs> I'm certain that conversation said, well, we could. It would make it a lot easier. We wouldn't have all to it, drive out. All it's uh, Skynet. 
<laughs> yeah, I, you know, then we're all the way there. We're practically there now. It, it's madness. It really is madness. Okay, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I, I would love to have you back sometime. And and I know we had at, talked about this earlier. I have a lot of people that have a lot of questions about some of the things that they're experiencing with technology. And some of those questions are legal questions. As I had discussed with you before we started this conversation, I have like a lot of domestic violence victims that are having their devices used against them and it's causing problems for them. Mm -hmm. um, is there any chance as a legal mind master and expert that you would be willing to come back if uh, I happen to get some questions that are uh, of interest uh, to you? Would you be willing to come back on and kind of address some of the questions if anybody has any? I would love to. I, I have to be a little bit modest here about my, my expertise, but um, uh, I, I'd i be happy to, to answer or try and answer anything that might come your way. That would be fantastic. Um, I really appreciate that. Let me see if I had any other questions. What's one tip that you can give our listeners slash viewers to empower them in cybersecurity in today's world? If you're at all involved in commerce, don't store any data uh, or as, as little data on your customers as you can. Uh, in my own case, I, my virtual law firm runs a, a credit card payment system, but I'm not keeping those credit cards. I don't want them. And I've handed it off to the payment processor, and that's their problem. So, I mean, to the degree that you can avoid keeping anything resembling personal information um, or <clears throat> information that can somehow be conjoined with other bits of inf information that is suddenly sensitive personal information, um, I would refrain from f storing uh, as much data as you can. Uh, um, stay away from that. <laughs> so what if you're storing the data on the cloud still applies to you? It still applies to you. Yeah. Sure. It's just that it's held on somebody else's servers and all. That's right. And, um, you know, I, I think that in a lot of cases, and this is still being worked out in courts, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't matter that you're going to say that, you know, this information was being stored in the cloud by provider X. And it was it was hacked into uh, by someone else? Uh, it doesn't matter if you're keeping that data. It chances are you're going to be held strictly liable for uh, whatever damages flow from that. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that you had nothing to do with running security at Microsoft or at Google or at you know um, any other of the the cloud services. God, it's almost like the entire thing needs to just be put on pause and rethought. Well, that... <laughs> I mean, really, truly, we're, we're so far over our skis and so far out front when it comes to technology, and more and more of it just keeps pouring in. And it's, we're, we're exposed legally, we're exposed physically, we're exposed... Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the, the pace of all of this. It was just last week that uh, chat GPT-3 was announced. They now have a million users, uh, and and the 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 AI there is doing some astounding, unprecedented sorts of things. We haven't had time to react to any of this. You know, when the automobile came along, when the radio thing, <laughs> when the telegraph came along, when all of these technologies came along, they did cause they did cause problems when they first arrived, but. The problems were addressable in a human time frame, right? In a in the time frame that a legislature might be able to work within. So we we got travel, oh, yes. we got yeah. traffic lights, we got you know uh, safety and eventually seat belts. Um, we were able to respond to them. My concern about uh, the impact of broadly information technology here is it's moving too fast for anybody to even respond in a um in any kind of thoughtful way to it uh no sooner is it out of the lab and into commerce and we've already accepted it and it's become part of our lives in in a way that we really can't give up yeah it's it's not an option to shut down the internet any longer it's moving faster than the speed of government yes and you can't keep up with it you're going to get caught up before any of them catch up. 
are the benefits outweighing the the risks? And I, I just don't know. That's right. And it's so fragmented in our response to it. I mean, take Internet of Things. How's that going to happen? Well, there's so much of it happening. How are it's you supposed already, to respond already, to it? Right. It's already out there, um, you know, from the from the toaster to the, uh, uh, you know, as you say, the doorbells. Um, it's already out there and it's being done by, you know, a thousand or 10,000 independent uh, firms that are under no particular constraints and have maybe no particular concern about privacy. <laughs> I, we're really, <laughs> again, I, I uh, up or up or down for the internet. I, I'm gonna, I'm going to do a thumbs down for the internet. You know, it's funny as as part of this generation that's grown up with it and and watched it, watched the birth of it on, and the impacts that it's had. I think about it from this perspective. You and I know that because we have a point of comparison. Mm -hmm. People that grew up with this thing since birth, yeah. they have no point of comparison. That's right. This is all they know. You know, waking up every morning is a gift, um, but there's so much work that's got to get done. All right. I, I don't want to take up your whole day either. And this was a really interesting conversation. It kind of just was a conversation between the two of us and just brought people along for the ride. Uh, <laughs> is is there anything else uh, that you would like to discuss before we wrap this up? Is there anything? I mean, I can always have you on at any time if you want to come back. Um, but is there anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover? Is there anything that we didn't cover? We pretty well wrapped it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can run down some pretty dark rabbit holes, though, if you'd like. Uh, we'll do that another time, though. But I'll come back to you, absolutely. If you're willing to take some some questions, I'll I'll kind of filter through the questions I would love that, that come in. I think that would be important for people. I think people have a lot of legal questions as to, you know, what do I do about this stuff? Um, and, and I don't really know what those questions would be at the moment, but I know they're definitely out there because I see a lot of people with a lot of questions. So uh, I would enjoy that. All right, Robert, I do appreciate your time today. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Cost. And we'll talk again soon. If you found value in this information, please hit that subscribe button. Please hit the notifier bell and share this on social media with your friends and family. Please stay tuned because there's more fun to come. I am security researcher. And if you just gave me the last 42 minutes and 33 seconds of your life, I want you to know that I really appreciate it. <laughs>